Now that we have some proper distinctions, the rest of our journey will be focused on answering one simple question. Are the modern Jews God's chosen people according to the Bible and according to history? And if not, why not? To find our answers, we will start back with Abraham, the father of monotheism. Many today argue that the Jews are still God's chosen people because God owes them the land he promised thousands of years ago to Abraham. But careful study reveals two significant problems with this argument. The first is that Abraham was not a Jew, nor was his son Isaac or his grandson Jacob. God made the promise to the Hebrews, who eventually became the Israelites. God did not make his covenant with the Jews, as you have hopefully learned by now. But the second problem is that these land promises were fulfilled a long time ago through the empire of Solomon. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 7 through 8, the Israelites are too numerous to count, which fulfills the promise of them becoming a great nation, numerous in number. In 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 21, the Bible describes the boundaries of Solomon's empire, which fulfilled the area of land described by God to Abraham in Genesis 15, verses 18 through 21. In Acts chapter 7, verse 17, Stephen recounts that the, quote, time of the promise was drawing near when the Hebrews were ready to begin the Exodus, which was around 1400 BC. And in Joshua chapter 21, verses 43 through 45, the Bible says that not one word of all that God had promised Abraham had failed, but rather that all had come to pass. But then why did the Jews lose their land if God had promised it to them? The answer is simple. The covenant of land was conditional, meaning it was dependent upon something they had to do, namely obedience. Because the Israelites whored after other gods, intermarried and rebelled countless times, they did not uphold their end of the bargain, and as a result, lost their land because God is just. Yet remember that the greatest blessing God promised Abraham, that he would bless all nations, was fulfilled in Christ through the gospel, and this is why the church, not the Jews, is the true body of chosen people. We'll talk more about this later, but important to understand here is that the church is not a denomination, a physical building, or any institution. It is simply the group of people God has chosen to save and give to Christ, the fellowship of true believers, which is the body of Christ. This is the true universal church, of which the Catholic church is a counterfeit of, so, we must be wise not to confuse the Bride of Christ with the Harlot of Babylon. Moving on. Another important piece of evidence that the Jews are not God's chosen people is Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. This prophecy was given to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 to predict the arrival of Jesus' ministry to the exact year. The context of this prophecy is that Daniel receives a greater prophecy of 2300 days in Daniel 8, but he's very troubled by it. In fact, he's so troubled by it that he falls sick and needs to rest. A good amount of time passes, and then Daniel 9 opens with Daniel crying out for help, with the Archangel Gabriel coming to give him clarity. It is how Gabriel begins this discussion and frames this prophecy that is very important. Gabriel says in Daniel 9 verse 24 that, quote, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. This means that out of the previous 2300 days that Daniel received from Gabriel in Daniel 8, a total of 70 weeks worth, or 490 days, are reserved for a special purpose, particularly the fulfillment of Israel's role in bringing about the promised Messiah. Notice again that this prophecy is dealing with Israel, not the Jews, which many people miss. But moving on. The important thing to understand about Daniel's 70 weeks is that they are not literal weeks but prophetic weeks, or weeks of prophetic days. In other words, the days represent actual years, so 490 years total. This brings up another important and related point. If Daniel's 70 weeks is historically fulfilled, then so are all of the time prophecies given in Daniel, including the 1260 day period which is echoed multiple times in the book of Revelation, and which the reformers recognized was fulfilled historically, leading them to see the Catholic beast system and its antichrist god-king, which is the Pope, as the fulfillment of these ancient warnings. 
Nevertheless, contrary to what most people believe about this prophecy, the 70th week of Daniel has already been fulfilled by Jesus. It is not about some future antichrist that will walk into a physical, rebuilt Jewish temple, with one simple reason being that no prophecy in the Bible has a gap in between two periods, let alone a gap that is longer than the prophecy itself. God's prophecies are always continuous, and what this means is that if we plot it out historically, we see with clear archaeological evidence this prophecy rightly predicts Christ's advent in 27 AD, his crucifixion in 31 AD, and the end of the Israelites' special status as God's chosen people happening in 34 AD. So, what happened in 34 AD that was so significant? Stephen was stoned and the apostles were dispersed from Jerusalem to the nations to spread the gospel. Shortly after, Paul was converted and Peter received his dream about the Gentiles. The time of the Old Testament was done, and with it the time for the Israelites as the physical chosen people was officially over. Next we have the imagery of Revelation 12, written down by the Apostle John sometime in the first century on the island of Patmos. This is a colorful vision of a woman who gives birth to the Messiah and then runs away from the dragon. A woman always represented the body of believers, and often Israel was called a virgin and described as God's bride, Ezekiel 16, yet after the birth of the Messiah, the church is the bride of Christ. This is in Ephesians 5, verse 25 through 27. What is crucial to understand from this vision is that the woman, which represents the body of believers, is the same before and after the Messiah. She is God's bride, God's elect through faith, or the body of genuine believers. In the Old Testament, that body of elect believers was largely limited to the nation of Israel because God's plan of salvation had not yet been fully revealed. Yet even within the nation of Israel, recall that there was a remnant that God had always reserved for himself through election. See 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, while leaving the others to rebellion and not saving them. With Christ, this sovereign electing purpose expanded to include all nations, and this new group of believers is the church or the body of Christ. This is proven by the fact that the woman in Revelation 12 remains the same before and after the Messiah, and her running away from the dragon for 1260 days is a picture of the true church being persecuted by the papal power from 538 AD to 1798 AD. Ironically, one of the main books of Rabbinic Judaism, the Babylonian Talmud, testifies against the Jews as being God's chosen people because of an interesting phenomenon that took place for exactly 40 years before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Basically, the Jews had always relied on signs during the Day of Atonement to confirm whether God had forgiven their sins. These were things like ribbons being tied around the goats' necks, turning different colors, or signs by lot. This is all documented in Yoma 39a. But now here's the interesting part. In Yoma 39b, the Talmud records that for exactly 40 years before the destruction of the temple, none of these signs for the Day of Atonement came to pass. In other words, God was giving the Jews a very clear message that they were not forgiven. If we count inclusively, as people did back then, what year do we arrive at by counting 40 years prior to 70 AD? The answer is 31 AD, the exact year that Jesus was crucified and rejected by the Jews. That means for 40 years God gave the Jews signs to repent because sacrifices were no longer accepted in light of Christ's death on the cross. But in the spirit of their fathers, most of the Jews remained stiff-necked and were judged in 70 AD for their rebellion. The temple was destroyed because there was no more need for it, and the time for biblical Israel as an outward show of God's electing purpose had come to an end in light of spiritual Israel, which is the church. This now brings me to some very important points. The reason the Israelites were chosen as a nation apart from other nations was so that the Messiah could be born. This alone is enough of a reason to know that the Jews are not God's chosen people because this purpose has long been fulfilled. God's promise of a savior was first given to Eve in Genesis 3 verse 15. 
Then it was repeated to Abraham in Genesis 22, verse 18, where God promised Abraham that his offspring would one day bless all the nations of the earth. This promise was fulfilled in Christ through the gospel, and it was foreshadowed by countless types and prefigurements in the Old Testament that God created through the Israelites to reveal his plan of salvation. The tabernacle in the wilderness, the high priesthood, the sacrifices, the kings, the judges, the prophets, and all the other important figures like Isaac, Joseph, Moses, and many others that all played their part in portraying some aspect of the coming Messiah and his ministry. So biblical Israel had two main purposes, to typify the Messiah through these various physical elements and to create a holy or set apart people from the nations that God could demonstrate his plan of salvation through by bringing about the incarnation and life of Jesus. As of the resurrection, both of these purposes have been fulfilled and we are now in the new reality with a new way of relating to God through Jesus Christ. This was the mystery hidden through the ages that was revealed in Jesus, which the Apostle Paul discusses in Colossians 1, verse 26 to 27. It was the mystery that God himself would take on human form, become the propitiation for our sins by obeying the law perfectly, and yet be put to death unjustly, only to resurrect and conquer death for all those who believe in him. Through the perfect and infinitely valuable sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, God's name as a righteous judge was vindicated because he had passed over countless sins in history. That's Romans 3, verse 25. Through this once-for-all priceless gift, God also set the legal precedent to forgive sinners and give them new life through his Holy Spirit. This is a profoundly unique and different reality than the Old Testament or any other spiritual teaching or religion in history, for that matter. In this new reality of fellowship with God and one another, there is neither Jew nor Greek, that's Galatians 3 verse 28, and the meaning of a Jew is one who is inwardly circumcised through a new heart, not outwardly circumcised based on the flesh, that's Romans 2 verse 29. Because Christ's sacrifice was perfect, there is no more need for regular sacrifices to approach God. On the contrary, we are encouraged to offer ourselves up as living sacrifices, that's Romans 12 verse 1 to be part of God's unfolding will in the world. Instead of a physical temple that limits worshiping God to a singular place, we are now living stones in a spiritual house that can worship God anywhere. See 1 Peter 2, 5, Matthew 18, verse 20, and Revelation 3, verse 12. Those who believe in Jesus are also a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation to God. That's 1 Peter 2, verse 9, proclaiming the riches of his mercy through the gospel to the world. This is the true chosen people of God, the Israel of faith, those whom God has chosen to save and give to Christ. John 6 verse 44 says that no man can come to Christ unless the Father draws him. And earlier in John 6 verse 39, Christ says that it is the will of the Father that Jesus lose nobody that the Father gives to him. This is the sovereign predestining purpose of election that God has revealed through the gospel. See Romans 8 verse 28 through 30. And it's why Paul said that not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. See Romans 9, verse 6. He also said that we as believers in Christ are the circumcision, that's in Philippians 3, verse 3, that we are called the Israel of God, Galatians 6, verse 16, and why before Jacob and Esau were even born, God had predetermined who would be blessed through his sovereign choice. That's Romans 9, verse 11. It is also why when the Pharisees bragged of their physical lineage back to Abraham, Jesus rebuked them and told them the truth, that their father was the devil and that they lusted to do his works. John 8, 44. One thing today's zealous dispensationalists or Christian Zionists fail to realize is that the New Testament doesn't play identity politics. In the Old Testament, identity politics were necessary. But in the New Testament, these divisions have been done away with because of the arrival of Christ. Trying to cling to divisions of the flesh is not in alignment with the gospel, and just like Jesus said in Luke 5, verse 37 to 39, it's like trying to put new wine in old wineskins. Instead of interpreting the Old Testament realities through the New Testament, those who have bought into the narrative that the Jews are God's chosen people do it the other way around. They use the Old Testament to interpret the new.
Today, Christians falsely believe that Judaism is not only the faith of Abraham and the Israelites, but also the root of Christianity. The term Judeo-Christian is often peddled by ignorant people or Zionist puppets to camouflage what is inherently an antichrist counterfeit with the truth of God that is revealed in the gospel. Again, a bit of history here is important. When the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in the 6th century BC, and both Israel and Judah were exiled for 70 years, many things changed. Without a temple to offer sacrifices, the Israelites could not practice the laws given to them through Moses. As a result, this led to the rise of synagogues, houses of worship and study, yeshivot, schools for training rabbis, and of course, the office of rabbi. Instead of being guided by the Levitical priests, the prophets, and the kings as God had intended, because all of these people were pictures of Christ, the rabbis now became the authorities who established various laws and practices for Israel. It is important to note that Babylon's pagan and mystical practices also influenced these religious developments. Unlike biblical Israelites, who saw only the scriptures as authoritative, today's Jews consider a variety of texts as authoritative, such as the Mishnah, which is a rabbinic commentary on the scriptures, Targums, which are old Aramaic interpretations of the scriptures, Midrash, which are old rabbinic commentaries, the Talmud, the Zohar, and also Kabbalah. Out of these, the Talmud, the Zohar, and Kabbalah are completely contradictory to the Old Testament. The Zohar and Kabbalah deal in the occult and teach mysticism, and the Talmud contradicts the Hebrew scriptures in many ways. Rabbis today also use gematria, which is practically divination, and for anyone who has looked into the practice and beliefs of Kabbalah with discernment, it is nothing more than the lie from the Garden of Eden. Today, countless celebrities are in the Kabbalah club, and people don't realize that it is part of the secret religion that all of the elites partake of, which is really the worship of Lucifer. Makes you wonder why Trump, who is supposedly so against the establishment, had a Jewish Kabbalah teacher, doesn't it? That's on page 188 of Trump, The Way to the Top. But I digress. The Jews today also consider the beginning of the day at sundown, and practice the Sabbath from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Yet this too is a Babylonian inversion and tradition of man. Sadly, even Sabbath-keeping Christians have been duped by this, aligning with rabbinical Judaism instead of what the Bible clearly teaches, that the day begins with the greater light, which is the sun, not the lesser light, which is the moon. After all, why would God start the day with darkness? These are inversions, and they are easy to spot because all the devil does is take what God has created and flip it upside down. Now, let's get back to the rabbis. When the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the rabbis who had rejected Christ had to come up with a solution for atonement, especially with the rise of the gospel which promised forgiveness of sins. They reasoned amongst themselves that God would not demand something that was impossible to fulfill, like temple sacrifices, so they created their own substitution for atonement called the Great Three Concepts, Teshuva, Repentance, Tzedekah, Righteous Deeds, and Tefillah, Prayer. This is really when Judaism completely split from the Hebrew Scriptures and became the works righteousness religion it is today. But now, do you remember how for exactly 40 years after Christ's death, God rejected their signs for the Day of Atonement? Despite this obvious sign, the countless signs of Scripture through prophecy and typology, and the sign of judgment that fulfilled Christ's prophetic words in 70 AD, the stubborn Jews still decided that they could approach God with their own substitutionary atonement. Does this remind you of anyone in the Bible? If you said Cain, then you'd be right. Cain was rejected by God because he wanted to approach God on his own terms, not on the terms that God had provided. And today's Judaism is no different. This is why it has nothing to do with Hebrewism, or the Levitical religion of the Israelites, and why it cannot claim any connection thereof. Other developments in Rabbinic Judaism are as follows. From 400 BC to about 200 AD, we see the rise of the Mishnah, or Oral Law, which is a commentary on the Old Testament. In other words, it is a Rabbinic interpretation of the Old Testament that is counted equally as authoritative as the Word of God. By Jesus' day, the Pharisees, who were part of this rabbinic system, were sharply criticized for twisting the scriptures for their own gain and nullifying God's laws through their traditions. 
Several centuries after Christ, we see the development of the Gemara, which is a commentary on the Mishnah. So basically a commentary on another commentary that is also authoritative. What all these developments add up to is that today's Judaism is its own religion that has no connection to the Hebrew scriptures. At best, it is an in-name only connection, and at worst, it is a satanic counterfeit, just like Catholicism is with Christianity. The reality is that Judaism did not begin with Abraham as the Jews claim. Rather, Judaism began as a counterfeit of Hebrewism during the Babylonian captivity, continuing to splinter off by Jesus' time and, after the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD, solidifying itself as, quote, the religion of the Jews. But Judaism is in complete contradiction to the Hebrew scriptures for several reasons. So let's go over those reasons. Number one, the authority of scripture. Hebrews like Moses and Israelites like Paul held the scriptures as God-breathed and completely authoritative. In contrast, Jews today hold many texts and traditions as equally authoritative, even though these other sources contradict scripture. Orthodox Jews believe that the Torah, which is the first five books, is more authoritative than the rest of the scriptures, while Reformed Jews hold that the Hebrew Bible as a whole is a human document outlining history, culture, legends, and attitudes of the Jews. Revelation to Reformed Jews is an ongoing process, meaning that new revelations from authoritative leaders are equally valid to scripture. Lastly, conservative Jews believe that the Hebrew Bible is the word of both God and man. To them, scripture is not inspired in the traditional sense, but rather, it's some kind of cooperation between man and God. Revelation for them is also an ongoing process. So, what's the conclusion? In no form of today's Judaism does the Old Testament stand alone as the sufficient and completely authoritative word of God, like it did for Moses, and like it did for Paul, and like it does for true biblical Christians. Number two, the nature of atonement. From Adam to Noah to Job to Abraham to Moses to the time of Jesus, atonement with God has always been by grace, through faith, via a propitiatory sacrifice. In other words, a sacrifice that paid for your sins was the only way to approach God, and God allowed these sacrifices to be done in place of killing people for their sins because of his grace. This was expressly communicated in Leviticus 17.11, and the New Testament echoes this in Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Atonement cannot be achieved by good deeds or prayers or effort of any kind, because God is a just judge, and a just judge cannot let you pay for past crimes with future good works. That's not how our judicial system works, and it certainly is not how God works. This is the fundamental issue not just with Judaism, but every religion and why Christianity alone has the solution through a once-for-all perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ. But the Jews today do not have a temple nor legitimate sacrifices to approach God with. In order for the Jews to claim that Judaism is 4,000 years old, they have to show a consistent adherence to the Hebrew scriptures, which they can't show, and this is why Judaism is its own religion. Another issue is that if they do build the temple and reinstate animal sacrifices, God will see this as an abomination according to Proverbs 15 verse 8 and other places. To reject the sacrifice of the perfect Son of God, which was testified to for thousands of years, and to try to approach God with a dead animal as a substitution is not only laughable, but truly an abomination. Number 3. The Nature of God Rabbinical scholar Alan Segal's landmark book on the two powers in heaven theology the Jews had for several centuries, as well as close study of the Old Testament, reveal a striking truth. The Israelites acknowledged that Yahweh was one God existing in plurality. There are many things to discuss on why this is the case, but one easy example is the angel of Yahweh, which is a mysterious figure that shows up many times in the Old Testament that claims to be God, takes credit for God's actions, and receives worship. Yet also, he speaks about Yahweh in the third person often. These confusing situations led the Jews to adopt the belief that there were two powers in heaven, without compromising their monotheism. In fact, the Jewish sages of antiquity struggled to understand how the immaterial, omnipresent God could interact in the world and do all these things. So they came up with the concept of the Memra, or the Word. This Memra was God, but also distinct from God. And many of the ancient Targums, like the Targum Neophyti, or Targum Onkelos, 
translated the Hebrew scriptures with this theology in mind. An example would be Genesis 1 verses 1 through 3, translated in Targum Neophyti, which reads as follows. From the beginning with wisdom, the Memra, which is the word of the Lord, created and perfected the heavens and the earth. And the Memra of the Lord said, let there be light, and there was light by his Memra. Does this remind you of something? If you said John 1 verses 1 through 3, then you would be right. John was playing off of these cultural attitudes and specifically identified Jesus as the word so that the Jews would know he was the prophesied Messiah and Savior, who is also God incarnate. Yet in sharp contrast to these beliefs, today's Jews do not believe in a multi-personal God. In fact, most Jews have a limited view of God and his sovereignty. Unlike the Israelites of the Old Testament, they do not believe God is sovereign over salvation, because Judaism is works-based, and they do not believe in a multi-personal God either, like biblical Israelites did for several centuries. An interesting fact is that the two powers in heaven theology was declared a heresy by the rabbis shortly after Jesus' resurrection and the rise of Christianity. Coincidence? I think not. Number four, the nature of the Messiah. The last point to mention is that the Jews of today hold a vastly different view of the Messiah than the Israelites did in the Old Testament and even during Jesus' time. It is beyond clear from several texts that the Jews expected a supernatural Messiah, a God King of sorts, to come and rescue them. The vision of the Son of Man in Daniel 7, who receives dominion and worship, is a deity figure, and when Jesus applies this to himself when he was put on trial by the Pharisees, they tore their robes and accused him of blasphemy. Like with all the previous points, today's Jews live in sharp contrast to the Old Testament with their view on the Messiah. Instead of one Messiah, they believe in two, the Ben Joseph and the Ben David Messiah. And instead of a divine God King that is worshipped as God, they believe anyone can be the Messiah if the political circumstances are right. They also believe that it's up to them to do certain things to bring about the return of the Messiah, whereas the Old Testament testifies of God's sovereignty over the revealing of the Messiah through countless prophecies. In other words, nothing man could do would affect when Jesus was going to be born and when he would die. And that is why today's Jews yet again have nothing to do with the Hebrew Scriptures. A quick, fun fact about the book of Daniel is the following. It is recorded that the rabbis placed a curse on anyone trying to calculate the arrival of the Messiah according to Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, found in Daniel 9. This curse is found in the Talmud, Sanhedrin 97b. The surface reasoning is that if you get the calculation wrong, the Messiah might not show up. But by now I'm sure you know the real reason those rabbis didn't want anyone snooping around in Daniel 9. So you see my friend, when it's all said and done and carefully examined, Judaism is very different from the Old Testament. In fact, they have nothing in common. Judaism is Cain-style worship that began during the Babylonian exile and solidified itself in rebellion after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. The Jews and Israelites who understood the Old Testament converted to Christianity, because the truth is that Christianity is the continuation of the Hebrew Scriptures, not Judaism. Those who rejected Christ and followed in the rebellion of their fathers are the ones who established Judaism. This means that Christianity is actually older than Judaism, because Christianity is the fulfillment and continuation of God's Word and His promises, not Judaism and not the Jews. So next time someone mentions Judeo-Christian anything, make sure to politely ask them to not combine two things that have nothing to do with each other. As if all the previous points weren't enough to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Jews are not God's chosen people, there are still yet even more pieces of evidence to examine. One of those pieces of evidence is that of a chosen, set-apart people that models what God stands for. A holy nation, a set-apart people that loves God and shows the world who He is through their behavior and beliefs. This is what God had in mind from the very beginning. But as we know, history testifies against the Israelites because of their countless rebellions and apostasies.